So now we take a look at a couple of problems. The first one is 558, in which we have a walkway for loading and unloading ships at a wharf. The elevation of the walkway is controlled by cable BCD, which is attached to a drum on a geared motor at B. So as that motor winds up that cable, we'll change the angle of inclination of the walkway. Uh, we're treating the load on the walkway in terms of a single one kip force. You can think of that as a combination of the effective center of the weight of the walkway plus whatever loads are added on it. And we're going to treat that as positioned as halfway between points A and C. Under these conditions, we want the forces supported by cables BCD and DE, the reactions at A, and the force supported by bar DF. Take a few minutes now and try this problem yourself. Resume playing when you're ready to see a solution. One of the things we notice about this problem is that there's a lot competing for our attention. We have the rigid body ABC, and we're certainly going to need to examine that, but we also have a joint at D where cable segments BCD and DE and member FD come together. So ultimately, we're going to be looking at two different free body diagrams, one involving the body ABC, and one will essentially be a particle free body diagram examining the joint at D where these three different members come together. So we'll take them one at a time. Let's first think about what we could do with respect to the walkway ABC. So we have this option of either leaving pulleys on the, uh, the body or taking them off. If we look at the first option, we would have an enveloping surface that goes through the bearing at A and cuts through the cable, the upper cable segment just once at this location. And uh, so in terms of drawing the free body diagram with with cable segments and tensions, there's only one place where we cut through the cable segment. And probably what we're going to do is transfer this back to the point where the cable segment comes off the pulley at C. And then if we think about the complications that will ensue in taking moments, we're going to have to figure out exactly where this point is. And that's going to involve a, a radius back to the center of the pulley at C. And that angle is actually going to be, uh, it looks like it might be straight up, but it's actually going to be five degrees off to the vertical because this angle between that radius and where the cable segment comes off the pulley is 90 degrees. So that's going to complicate our ability to take moments. So instead of that choice, I will cut through this with a more complicated enveloping surface so that uh, I ultimately have what will be a simpler equation of motion uh, even though there will be more forces present. So now we'll cut through the bearing at A, we'll cut through the upper cable segment, and then as we come around the pulley, we'll cut through it once here, and then separately over here, and that will be our enveloping surface. And now we'll have three cable tensions that will appear in our uh, free body diagram. Here's my walkway AC, and I've got bearing forces or pin forces at A, AX and AY. I've got my external load of one kip. And then uh, let's suppose this is my motor. Uh, I've got to cut through the, the cable segment on the bottom, and so I'm going to have a tension here that's supposed to be tangent to the motor. Uh, and then I would have two tensions off the pulley at C, but since we're going to be separating that from the pulley, one of those uh, can be, well, one of them, the lower one, is parallel to, to the walkway AC, and that will transfer in, in this direction, and then the one at the top will transfer like this. So the upper segment will be inclined at 5 degrees, uh, the lower one will be aligned along the walkway, and then we've got the uh, the tension coming off the uh, motor at the bottom. Uh, a natural point for us to take moments is the pin at A. The bearing forces AX and AY won't contribute anything to those moments. And we might also note that the tension right here has a line of action that also goes through A, so we, we might not include that. However, there's a smarter thing we can do with that tension to further reduce the complication of the moment equation. 
we can note that we've got two parallel tensions here that are separated by the pulley radius at C. So that constitutes a force couple of strength T times the pulley radius, and we can see from the orientation of those cable segments that it's clockwise or negative. We could also see that it's possible for us to resolve the tension in the upper segment, the one that's inclined at five degrees, to components parallel and perpendicular to the walkway. Uh, if we do that, we'll note that this angle here is 15 degrees. That's the angle of inclination of five degrees of the upper segment plus the, the downward 10 degrees orientation of the walkway. And if we resolve that parallel and perpendicular to the walkway, then the parallel part also has a line of action that goes through A. And so the only thing that will contribute to moments about A from that upper segment will be the T sine 50 to 15 degrees component. So in spite of the fact that we've got a lot of stuff going on here in our free body diagram, our moment equation about A will, will actually be uh, pretty simple. First, the force couple from those two parallel tensions will be minus T times the radius of the pulley at C. And then the contribution from the upper cable segment will simply be another clockwise contribution. It'll be minus T sine 15 degrees times the length of the walkway, which is nine feet. Then the only other contribution we have is from the one kip load, and that's a vertical force, so we need the horizontal distance that's halfway between A and C. The horizontal distance would be nine feet cosine 10 degrees, so we have a plus one kip load times one half nine feet cosine 10 degrees equals zero. And that result then will give us that the tension will be equal to one kip times one half of nine feet cosine 10 degrees over the radius of the pulley at C plus nine feet sine 15 degrees. The radius of the pulley is listed as eight inches so this is two-thirds of a foot. And if I plug those numbers in, I get a value for the tension that's equal to 1.48 kips. Now finding the bearing forces at A is straightforward because we'll use some of the forces in X equals zero. And again, we might notice that because we have this force couple involving these two tensions, they're not going to contribute anything to force equilibrium. Here we're simply going to have AX plus the X component of the upper cable tension, which will be T cosine 5 degrees equals 0. And so AX is minus T cosine 5 degrees, which is minus 1.47 kips. In the Y direction, We have AY plus T sine 5 degrees minus 1 kip equals 0, and that gives us AY is equal to 0 0.871 kip. Now having found this tension, we can go back and look at the joint at D. And now our free body diagram is going to involve this enveloping surface. There are two forces present at D, and there's a pin support at F. And this member FD is again going to satisfy conditions for a two-force member. So uh, even though the pin at F, we would normally think of having FX and FY components, uh, the nature of this member is going to be such that the force is transmitted just along the member vertically. And so when we draw the free body diagram that goes with that, it's going to look like this. So here's our tension T that we've just found. We're going to have a cable tension 
DE on this side. And we're going to have uh, the member FD is going to be in compression, so I'm going to call that CFD. We might just note that the figure gives us these angles. Uh, this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle over here, and again, this is a 5 degree angle on this side. So if we write some of the forces in x and y equal to 0, uh, we have first minus t cosine 5 degrees plus 3 fifths FDE equals 0. And that gives us a force in member DE that's equal to 2.457 kips. Let's just call it 2.46 kips. And in the y direction, we have the compression in member FD minus T sine 5 degrees minus FDE times 4 fifths equals 0. And if we solve for the compression in member FD, that gives us 2.095 kips. For our second try me problem, we have an office chair with a compressed spring that allows the chair to tilt backward when a sufficiently large force F is applied. Uh, and when F is small, there's a stop at point A that prevents the chair from tilting forward. So this looks a lot like the brake handle problem that we had in the, in the lecture. Uh, given that the spring has a 10 pound per inch stiffness and a 15 inch unstretched length, we want the value of F that will cause the chair to begin tilting backward. Take a few moments to try this problem yourself and resume playing when you're ready to see a solution. So we can again note that because we're interested in the, the threshold force F that will cause the chair to begin tilting backwards, we're looking at a condition where we're breaking contact at A, and so when we isolate the chair, we won't have any normal force there. Our enveloping surface is going to end up looking something like this. We're going to cut through the bearing at B, or the pin at B, as well as the spring here. And uh, notice that the compressed, or the length of the spring that's shown in the problem statement is 8 inches. The spring is given a, having an unstretched length of 15 inches, so we know this is in compression and pushing up on the chair. So if we go to draw a free body diagram of this, we have the bearing at B, the pin at B, we've got BX and BY, uh, we have the spring force at C, which is in compression. Uh, we've got 120 pounds from the person sitting in the chair, and then we have the force F from leaning back in the chair. And uh, we can figure out this force by taking just moments about B, because BX and BY won't contribute anything there. So if we take some of the moments about B and set that equal to zero, uh, we have uh, the spring force times uh, 6 inches. And then we have two clockwise contributions from the force exerted on the chair. So we have minus 120 pounds times 2 inches and minus F times 14 plus 3 inches or 17 inches. So the spring force is something we know. It's in compression, so I'm going to write it as the spring constant K times now the unstretched length, which is going to be larger than the stretched length. It'll be in compression. Uh, and this is going to be 10 pounds per inch times 15 inches minus 8 inches. And so we've got a 70-pound spring force. So our uh, force F for tilting backwards is going to be equal to uh, the spring force times 6 inches, so 70 times 6 is 420 inch-pounds, and then we have uh, minus 120 times 2, so that's 240 inch-pounds, and then we're dividing this by 17 inches. We have 180 inch-pounds over 17 inches, and that gives us a threshold force of 10.6 pounds, 
to begin tilting the chair backward. 